Welcome to another episode of Creative Leaders Unplugged. I'm Morgan here with Arna, and today we talked with Lee Kim. And yeah, we also, she reflected on who she is, who she's yeah. becoming, and all of the things that have made her that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very um, beautiful person. Um, mm -hmm. I remember seeing the film made by the, uh, the New Yorker um, about her, the short film, uh, and about her, what she calls the uh, wearable Tracy's. Um, these hats is made out of pipe cleaners, um, mm -hmm. which is such an amazing story that is attached to it. And I don't want to go and get too deep into it because that's basically what we're going to talk about. And she... But we also talk a lot about other things as well, but it's all connected. It's all connected because also, like you said, she's a beautiful person and you can see that in the wearable Tracy's, but then also in how she was approaching some other things. Yeah. And uh, it's, it was a com it's one of those conversations that make me excited for life. Uh, and uh, <laughs> oh, kind of, yeah no really like it, it kind of like opened up the possibilities like oh how can I approach things differently and how can I start to make changes in my environment and how I approach things that might lead to more exciting outcomes yeah, you, and you share something with her right? yes yeah and yeah. how well, we I think you shared more than, than than one thing but specifically I was going to uh, thinking of, uh, you know, moving from one country, one culture to another. Uh, yeah, correct. Because of a similar reason, uh, mm -hmm. not seeing the future in the country that you're from, and then basically, you know, giving yourself a, a new option, a new new opportunity, you know, somewhere totally new, a new start, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and I wouldn't say I was necessarily like country-based, but just, hey, based on how things are going, it's not going to work this isn't how I want it to go. And her and I both uh, approach that transition in a similar way, which was yeah. interesting to find out. Yeah. But also nice. Yeah, like, oh. yeah exactly. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. the, uh, yeah, I actually don't want to say much too more. much. Yeah. No. Right. Because I'm like, no, it was just really, I mean, of course, all of our conversations we have on this podcast are interesting, but this one has really somehow sparked something. I can, like, it feels like my body is sparkling. It doesn't look like that. I still look normal and tired, but <laughs> but I can I can really feel like it's activated something within me to yeah. think about. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> to uh, to think about things differently. So I hope it also does the same for anyone who's uh, yeah willing to listen. Okay, enjoy. I'm from South Korea. I was born on an island called Jeju-do, um, and it's a very special island because it's a place where we speak different dialect. Very so different that we actually have a subtitle when people from mainland watch a video uh, or drama from that island. And I say that because I left the island when I was 11. Um, and then I left Korea when I was 18 to come to state. And my identity, I think, of who I am start from where I started of an island girl. But my true identity of who I became came when I came to the States, because that's when I began to question who I was. When I was in Korea, I never questioned who I was because everybody else was the same. You know, we all had um, same identity about the country, about who we are, about the society we belong, the customs we have to. But when I came to the state, I began to question, who am I if I'm not? in the country I was born in, and who am I if I'm not the knowledge that I gained from the country I was born in? And so now I call myself a human with deep curiosity and also a way to kind of explore who I could become rather than who I was born into. So I'm still defining myself of, of that, but I think what drives me is that curiosity to understand who am I if I am not who I am today. Um, so I'm more interested in who I become tomorrow than who I am today. But I know that who I am today depend on who I was yesterday. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I just well, something that always triggers me is island. Um, because I think, I mean, nation, country, yes, but island, there's something specific around 
an island is culture, being what we call it. In other words, we have these islanders, we call them. <laughs> so people who are, so we have this, a few islands uh, uh, here in the, nor in the north of uh, the Netherlands. And they are, they, they see themselves also very separate from the mainlanders. Um, which you know, they call, well, in Dutch, it sounds different, but in English, it translated would be the, the uh, other siders. <laughs> <laughs> and the people who are on the other side, which is really interesting, um, uh, because that's that's a really strong identity right there. It's not just a nation, but it's an island, and then so it's really interesting to see how that actually led you to question who you are, uh, because you actually have a, in, that's a very strong identity. I mean, was it was it a scary thing for you? Was it did it make you insecure? So I think 11, when I left the island to go to Seoul, um, I I knew that I spoke differently, although I know how to speak Korean, right, the, the mainland, because that's how we speak mm -hmm. in, in schools. Um, I practice a lot to speak like the mainland, the, the Seoul, the standard Korean. But then when I come back to the island, I'll try to... Uh, speak the dialect and it takes about two to three days to get fully acclimated back to the island dialect and I thought that was really important for me to be able to be connect reconnected by speaking the language of the islanders uh, when I went back af after 10 20 30 years um, and I still try to speak the dialect my uh, my cousins will say like what what language are you speaking we don't speak like that anymore, oh. you know, because language evolves. Oh, yeah. But I stayed in that, you know, oh, when yeah. I was 11. Um, and I think that's really, really important for for us to understand the cultural assimilation, how it happens. It doesn't only happen within like a different um, countries. It also happens within tribes. Uh, in this case, you know, the island, as you said, was a different tribe than the mainland uh, where they spoke differently, they acted differently in certain ways. And I do believe that there is a strong characteristics of survivalism for the islanders because we weren't given everything, right? The, the the earth was not very fertile. The wind was strong and people had to survive by learning different ways. So I was told uh, by my friends in, in the mainland that the island women are headstrong, not in a positive way. They're, they're not saying this <laughs> one in a positive way. Uh, but I kind of see that as like, yes, I am independent and I can say what I think without really thinking about your feelings about how this is going to come across, right? So you also have to learn to kind of soften up a little bit. And when, and was there, because then you had two big shifts quite young, you know, one from the island to the mainland and then from uh, the mainland then to the United States. How did those, yeah, w were there any big culture shocks either at 11 or 18 that really kind of forced you to also reflect on, well, of course you reflect on yourself because you're in a new place and question, yeah. you know, like you said, who am I? But were there any like culture shocks that you didn't expect or that really stood out to you? Yeah, um, you probably experienced it when you went from Ohio to Netherlands. Um, for me, of course, the the main culture shock was expectation versus what it is. So when I thought of America, uh, I thought America is just like, you know, I thought about New York City as America, right? Mm -hmm. And I, when I first landed, I landed in Boston and I did my language school outskirts of Boston, which we drove miles and miles and miles. The highway never ended. And in Korea, I never went on the highway, first of all. I don't remember being on a highway. And I don't remember going for that long of, of a ride on a car. And then there were not that many tall buildings. Like, you know, Seoul was a lot more sophisticated than, you know, this little Than the town. outskirts of Boston yeah. or Boston, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the culture shock was like, oh, my God, this is like a desolate. You know, it's not... Um, it's not that many people here. <laughs> what am I going to do? And then, of course, the cul another culture shock was um, I am no longer, or the 
career that I believed in when, when I was taught the history and the things that we were taught. We pride ourselves on certain things. Um, some things that sounds really silly, but it was something that I grew up in that we have four seasons. And we actually pride ourselves on having four seasons. And we pride ourselves on having blue, deep blue skies. And we pride ourselves on having a beautiful foliage. And when I, because I came to the New England, you know, it had four seasons. It mm. has beautiful foliage. And I begin to question, why was that so important to recognize things that were so not unique? You know, mm. like four seasons, blue skies and foliage. Mm. And, um, and then I thought, is it really that, that we are such a great nation? that we have to kind of put these things in the center. And I, I begin to question about like, what is a nation and why do, have, why do we have patriotism? Why do our uh, social studies focus on certain things and not others? Um, and and that, that's so something that I still kind of, you know, think a lot about like, you know, colonialism, of course, um, you know, we experienced it as Koreans. You know, we had a, a long history of um, being colonized. Mm -hmm. And but I didn't really know the deep pain that my ancestors has gone through. And I actually see that a little bit more when I am seeing, you know, our neighbors, whether it's, you know, um, African-Americans or um, our Native Indians or even sometimes Asian-Americans in America being discriminated, right? Then you feel it a little bit more. Um, so those, but I think those things of like being able to think independently without having other people to tell me what to think or what is right and what is wrong, um, it it comes with a lot more of not just uh, going with my, what I read, but actually being able to talk to others. And I, I wasn't able to do that when I was young, I'm talking about when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, I think I began to do a lot more of learning from others and singing rather than what is right and what is wrong, singing what is it like to be you? Like, what is it that you have experienced that was different from me? And I think that kind of openness comes from being in a very diverse um, environment like New York is, I, I say to people, New York feels like home because everybody is so different that I feel the same. Yeah. Mm. You know, if yeah. if I feel the same, if everybody is the same, yeah, yeah, yeah. my small uniqueness will start, start out as something that's very different. But because everybody is so different that even if you are very yeah. different, you are one of the different yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. Of, You're of all really, the same in being yeah. different. Yeah. So the difference that that's so interesting because like the unofficial Arna can correct me on this, the unofficial phrase of the Netherlands is just be normal. That's already crazy enough. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh boy. Yes. Yes. Where then yeah. you're saying, hey, okay, all of us and our uniqueness and our differences, then all of that also becomes normal. And that's one of the things that I've also really struggled with um, coming from the States to then living in this culture where everybody places a value on this this kind of downplaying things. I mean, the prime minister rides to work on a bicycle, you know, yeah. is really like playing the, the normalcy card. So it's a very, uh, that's really, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're all normal. Yeah, which is really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, you yeah. shouldn't be so normal. Yeah. <laughs> there must be something wrong with you. Yeah, there must be all something... so normal. Exactly. Yeah, there, there must be, be some conspiracy theory going on behind the scenes yeah. to make everybody normal. For sure, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it has. I mean, that's also a cultural thing in the sense that in um, being, we're not. So the Netherlands is not an island, but we are a delta. And as a delta, um, you know, there's always a risk of flooding, and ha and that has happened. Um, and so, because there's these rivers coming in, and then there's the ocean, we're part, big part of the country is below sea level, and so we needed to create a culture, uh, and not, I mean, it's not like someone decided, but you know, you, you the, the, the the land that you're from, or where you live, really 
has an impact on who you are. And mountain people are different people than people who live in the plains, right? It's, it's yeah. it gets into your cycle. I, I truly believe that yeah. um, we are as human beings, and there's a, actually a wonderful book, um, Thinking Outside Your Brain, by the way. Um, and basically it talk, talks about, it's about embodiment, but it's about how um, we tend to think about our brain in a way we think, first of all, you know, we used to think about it as a computer, but your brain is not a computer. Uh, and then we said, no, it's like a muscle and it's not, but it kind of helps us to, because we want to compete and we say that, you know, that muscle is trained, trained better and more and stronger, or the computer is faster. And so we can compete, uh, you know, and, and, and so we have IQ uh, and this person is smarter than that person, but actually your brain is not that. Um, um, but it, but your brain, and this is why this book, uh, the title is really also provocative in the sense that it's uh, thinking outside of your brain. You're thinking outside of your brain, meaning that everything you touch, you smell, you see, the environment that you're part of, the you know the 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 office space or the wherever you are, it forms your thoughts. That forms who you are. Yeah. Uh, the people that you surround yourself with, et cetera, et cetera whether you've traveled or not, if you've seen different perspective, right? That changes you. This is why, you know, you're you're moving from one situation, one island to basically another island, which is yeah. New York City. <laughs> um, you know, but yeah. but 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 that transition enabled you to question things and say, hey, wait a minute, your thinking changed. If you would not have done so, uh, it would, I mean, sure, you would have had other experiences, but that would not have happened. So that... That's why, you know, it's so interesting. So the Nettle is a delta. And so we needed to make sure that we collaborate and that we can't do any crazy things. So there's one thing we call it poldern, which is sort of, uh, you know, the way we kind of um, protect the country is by creating polders. So which are basically bits of land, which are kind of surrounded by dikes. So uh, elevated areas that so the water can't, Come in, but those dikes need to be protected and maintained, and nobody wants the responsibility for this alone. You don't want that. No one wants to say, "Yes, I'm going to be in charge of all this stuff," because <laughs> it's complicated. And so we actually have a government that only. So there's a government that a part of the government. So we have local government, we have national government, we have city government, and we have government that rules the water, mm. and we mm -hmm. actually vote for them. Right, which is weird in a way. Water government. Yeah, because yeah, because yeah, because, yeah. Yeah, because, <laughs> because it's really important uh, because we need people to focus just on that, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that is interesting. It doesn't only uh, you know changes the way we organize as a nation, which all nations do in a way if you look deep enough, uh, but it also the, our it's our psyche in the way we 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 look at each other in the way we and this is why we're also I think this is my theory. And, uh, you know, if I'm wrong, send me an email. But I think uh, uh, this is why, for instance, Dutch are very direct. Uh, because you, we, need, we need to say what's going on. You can't go like, well, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, there's a dike. I remember, um, isn't there something, you know, that maybe people should do at a time of danger, or, you know, one of these days, maybe, you know, you go like, no. There's a, there's water coming, dike, danger, fix it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it needs to yeah. be acute because we are in a way, uh, there's this sort of acute danger always lurking, you know, which is yeah. not really true, but it's in our, we don't know that it's not something we, we, yeah. we but it's Th there. That's really interesting, Arne. So when, when did the water government begin? Is it always been there, the government that, kind of like take um, care of the water yeah well it kind of so i don't that history i'm not that sure of to be quite honest but uh i do know that when uh the sort of this country started kind of um um creating land out of water out of sea yeah you know building mm -hmm. it this is when basically that started and i don't know when it was officially a, a separate part of, of, yeah. of government yeah but it's been long, it's been this is like for hundreds of years and we had some disasters as well i asked the question because survival of the nation depends on this water uh, maintaining or kind of yeah. mm -hmm. taking care of the you know inflow and outflow of the water um how the world would have been 
different if something depend on our survival, right? So right now, I think there is a crisis in like, <laughs> you know, what if it was trees? Will you have a tree government? What if it was the air? Would you have an air government? What yeah. if it was, you know, whatever? Uh, and because we do have that for the water in like the, the ocean divides into certain like this belongs yeah. to this country, this belongs to that country, although it's not the same as the the land you have like markings i'm sure um the reason that i asked that question was because i think as humans and probably it's not just humans all all the animals that have life and death when the survival depend on it we begin to collaborate better right like at that moment that comes and we collaborate we find solutions and we move forward with it but it doesn't sustain for a long time, because once you are out of that danger, the crisis, then you mm -hmm. kind of move on to your uh, VAU. And I was thinking about like, however, you just mentioned, like, you don't know, you know, the, the water government, or however that long has been, but the danger is always lurking. Yeah, you know, so um, oh, yeah. and I, with I the it's... rising of the sea level, so yeah. it's, you know, it's getting more attention again, because it has been sort of something that you know, and like I said, there's actually uh, there's actually um, you know, we have to vote like every four years or so. We vote for for this uh, these uh, parties basically, and it used to be you know different political or political parties being back there's not a lot of politics going on there but now it's getting more attention also the main political parties kind of want to get into that bit of government as well so because of all that and so to your point um uh, it's really interesting if you see you know if there's danger if there's crisis you you work together yeah. um if that's uh, because that's maybe how you survive the best um, but sometimes we just don't see the danger because it's happening so slow. And I yeah. think, uh, you're right. So yeah. it's like this idea of, well, now we talk about global warming, for instance, but you know, it's being, it's so slow. And when change happens so slow, you don't even see it. You don't notice it. And like, yeah. you can't see the, you know, you can't see trees grow, but they're moving, but you can't see it because it's too slow. And so we don't notice it. So we take it we're kind of like, nah, nothing going. I don't see it, so it's not there. Must not but, be real. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it must not, yeah, it mustn't be real. The crisis co connection to collaboration is really interesting because I heard someone say um, uh, about COVID, all of these great scientific minds joined forces to collaborate on this one focus area. Yeah, And they said, if we could do that on every major, you know, medical situation, we could have these knocked out in like a decade, we would solve yeah. them if we all collaborated that intensely together all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Which, which yeah. moves, which I want sort of, um, I, want to, I want myself to ask this question then because you're at Pfizer and you were at Pfizer at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, I wasn't involved in the development of no. vaccines. <laughs> Have you? Did you? Were you the one? Did you Thank solve you. that? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. I was just glad to have the vaccine. You know. Yeah. No, but but you were kind of in an environment. Uh, you know, it, I mean, it, it, you know, you were in an industry that was getting a lot of pressure, right? And and basically from all sides. So you know, so. Is that something that you've experienced in a way? I mean, you have to... yeah. So because I'm not a scientist and I wasn't working in the lab, and there are you know people who had done the miracles. Um, what I did was actually because I was in part of the organization that deals with medical conferences, and of course all the gathering was being canceled. Right, no medical conferences were happening, and if you think about it, really. Um, Medical conference is important. That's where people come and share their newest data. You get to meet people, you get to collaborate. And if the gatherings are canceled, there is, although there are virtual gatherings happening, um, people did not have the pivoting point from going from live to virtual with the same kind of efficiency and um, the way to make that happen, right? How do we make sure that the gathering is happening in a way that people can get the benefits? So. What I did was um, there were a few people who got to know design thinking long before COVID, like seven years 
ago uh, in 20, yeah, about like 2017, um, I was able to bring people together with my team members. And we had like two days of design thinking um, sessions with medical associations and, you know, uh, with our folks here. And we thought, okay, that was fun. You know, oftentimes this happens, right? And you might have experienced this too, Arne um, and Morgan. It was fun, but nothing happened. Nothing, we thought nothing happened until crisis hit. And then, you know, people who participated in that session reached out and say like, hey, can we do something? Can we come together every Friday or something? Because I think we need to reimagine how the medical conferences will be. And so we begin to have just the workshops on engagement. How do we engage people differently? And then eventually in 2021, so like a year later, um, we were able to launch a collaborative called Big Bang Collaborative, where we brought in different medical associations, different medical biopharma um, companies, and then creative agencies to come together to reimagine the future of medical conferences. This wouldn't have happened. Nobody would have actually given any kind of thought into the need of us coming together if the crisis didn't hit and they they say, oh, we're doing fine. You know, the way that we are doing, putting the sage on the stage and have our uh, beautiful medical data to be released and have, you know, celebration, that was going fine as for the last hundred years. Why change? But we had to change because you that wasn't working anymore, right? So um, I say this to people, when you first start meeting people and giving different ways of dealing with the problems, and then you leave, you think nothing happened. But what we did was we planted the seed that was very slow to germinate. And I think the water that kind of, you know, allow it to give another life was the crisis. And when the crisis hit, that, you know, that thing wanted to kind of come out and show a different life than what it was before. And I think and it's, we are still doing it, right? We are still coming together. And actually, I'm going to have another meeting tomorrow, and then I'm going to have monthly meetings. And what we were able to do was to really think about how can we create medical engagement that is different than just a, you know, expert share out on things. Uh, we were able to create with different medical associations who are part of the Big Bang Collaborative. One team does one, and then we share that learning to another team because Conferences like this only happen once a year, right? The large medical conferences yeah. that brings like, you know, tens and thousands of people only happen once a year. So if you want to iterate, you have to wait until next year. However, there are hundreds of medical conferences in different fields just going on throughout the year. So if we can collaborate and then say like, hey, let's test out this type of engagement in January, and, let's and then let's iterate for February and then let's iterate for March. You can now do parallel testing rather than waiting for that vertical testing, right? So um, although I wasn't able to <laughs> contribute to the idea of um, creating a vaccine, I think we were able to come together and actually give the life to the little seed that we planted seven years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy that we did that because otherwise we wouldn't be in here reimagining the future of medical conferences as we were able to do for the last two years. Yeah, so in a way, it's really interesting because it, um, so, so the podcast focuses on a creative leadership, uh, which is just a something we want to kind of see because we feel everyone's a leader. and um, and But creative leadership is about creating uh, options that other people never thought about or weren't, you know, didn't even know was possible of connecting things that you were like, oh yeah. And sort of what you're talking about is is exactly that. You you saw sort of things um that were not connected, but were there but you know and the and the possibilities if you would connect it. And also the other thing is bringing people together, uh being sort of an someone who, who kind of creates movement. Right, mm -hmm. so um, I think that's a, that's also something that I, I, I'm not sure if it's a skill or it's a an attitude or it's a or, or it's just being courageous enough or, or 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 dumb enough to say, hey, let's get together and let's see what happens. Um, but 
that is something a lot of people don't do and can't do and find very difficult because it has to, you have to be, we call that sort of a, a being sort of having a heads up uh, kind of attitude. Okay? So you're not head down, you know, just working on what's over in front of you, but you go like, hey, what's around? You know, what else is here? And, oh, what if we bring that person together with that person and they're making those connections? I think that's a design skill that we don't always see and we don't teach um, in design schools or business schools, uh, I think, but I think that's probably one of the most important skills for, for people like you, uh, and within, you know, systems and organizations, uh, like, you know, the, the ones that you are in, because that's the real innovation happening. You make it yeah. possible. Uh, what I think happened was that, um, I recognize that I, I probably fall into the next one, what you said about, you know, you're either this one or that one. Um, not courageous, but I think I'm very dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> because what, what I believe is that I don't know well enough about the world around me to do everything on my own. But I have a lot of people around me who are smarter than me, who knows more than me in different ways than what I do. So I go and ask, like, hey, would you like to come together? Because I think we can do amazing things if we do X, Y, and Z. But I cannot do it without you. But that is because you have, very you have smart. that ability. Yes. Um, but that is very smart. That is being smart. <laughs> being, being dumb is saying, I have my expertise and I don't need anyone else. I mean... That, you know, maybe in the Middle Ages, maybe you could get away with that. Uh, <laughs> but nowadays, I mean, you can't design things or or, or implement things or, you know, have real impacts, uh, you know, without the help of other people. It's impossible. You need Yeah, if I go to school where I'm graded by saying, do you know everything? Ex do you have expertise in this area? Uh, I'll be, I'll score very low on expertise areas, right? Yeah, <laughs> However, so. I think, are you, uh, rec do you recognize your weakness? Do you recognize your strength? Do you, can you bring people together to do this? Um, then I probably will score higher on, on those yeah. things. Yeah, but this is where, sorry, I'm, I'm like, this can make me so angry, <laughs> this. That is because we measure intelligence in a very dumb way. <laughs> because you know we measure intelligence the way it suits the systems that yeah. you kind of we live and work in, but that's not what intelligence is. Uh, you know, in in the in the you know, there's you know being able to make those connections. Um, it's a you know, you know there's so many types of intelligence that you're not going to be scored on a school because yeah. that's not how that system works. You know, and I've been through that. I'm a school dropout and, you know, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, so I don't get to it. I mean, I have, I have children, they're going through school, and, you know, and they go through that same old system and being measured in ways that you go like, that. how can you measure intelligence like that? How can you grade kids like that? You know, grade them on asking questions, uh, you know, on, 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 on coming up with options, on, on whatever, critical thinking, whatever. There's so many ways of... Um, of, of teaching kids to um, that will enable them to be happy and healthy and successful, whatever that means uh, yeah. in life. There's so many other ways. So yeah, sorry. And I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking oh, we hadn't started <laughs> recording when, when Lee mentioned this, but I'm thinking, you know, we're talking about the system, right. And how sometimes the system does or doesn't work. But before we started recording, uh, Lee, you mentioned something like, yeah, I got asked this question and I was supposed to answer it, answered it in a specific way. But you you asked if you could answer it in a different way, and that <laughs> difference you didn't answer it in the systemic way they wanted you to. Yeah, um, it was maybe was probably ultimately made more sense, but because it didn't fit the system, it kind of was difficult for them. Right. And but and you also like you're talking about different systems, right? Like culturally, this is the land I'm from. Now I'm in a new land, or nationally, how is this identity? And then also with your switch, then from engineering to now working on uh, like experiences and bringing mm -hmm. people together. You've been in a lot of different systems, and then how do you find? Because of course the audience doesn't know this, but I'm looking at you and you're wearing this fantastic hat on your head. It's made out of pipe cleaners, and um, and there's a lot more to that, but you're also kind of finding ways to still work in the system, but also around and outside the system. So how did that 
that's a lot of people don't do that. So how yeah. did you, how, how did, how did you, what made you like that? Yeah. Really interesting question. Cause I have asked that question to myself a lot as well. How can you be still fitting in, but not lose yourself? Um, and then continue to kind of improve who you can become, right? Not um, fitting into where you were brought in. So like, although I didn't get the job that I went for because I didn't do the way that they were asking for, it also, it was a decision that I have made that if a leader can actually appreciate the way I do it, maybe it's a team that I can thrive in. But I made a decision to go with a non-systematic way of answering it. And, you know, that that might not have been the right choice at the time, but I made the choice. Um, in Korea, yeah. we have a word called nunchi, uh, and it is different from empathy. So empathy is kind of trying to be that person with curiosity. Nunchi is based on your life experiences. You kind of know what the other person thinks and do, but it, it requires a very special skill to fit in and kind of be able to survive. And because I left home when I was 11 and I was kind of surviving on my own without any guidance, I learned to acquire the skill of nunchi. Uh, and what I did through nunchi was not really understanding with curiosity. It was trying to figure out if I go this way, will I go faster? Will I go this way? So it's almost like manipulating, <laughs> you know? I'm not manipulating the system, but I'm manipulating myself to be in that system in a way that I could fit in. Um, now what I have learned was that there are actually better way than nunchi, which is if you can find the environment where the environment can see you can thrive better in certain ways and that can they can actually provide you with the conditions to thrive in that could help the environment, the system to be better. So me wearing the hat uh, started out as an accident, right? I forgot my friend's birthday and I started to wear this one and I made a rule. I'm going to wear it from nine to five because I want to be uncomfortable and remind myself. But what it created was this beautiful way of filtering people who are curious People, when I walk into the building in this headquarters of, you know, very um, established company, in the beginning when the individualism or uniqueness was not celebrated and fitting in was very important to the whole culture, many people frowned upon me and actually said, like, why is she doing this? Is she trying to stand out? Like, is there some kind of agenda behind what she's doing? But eventually, um, the company culture also shifted along the way the how the whole country was shifting, but I was the same, right? So you stay the same as who you are and you learn to see people. You're, so you no longer are doing the nunchi, manipulating yourself to be like somebody else. You're still true to yourself, but you understand how the system is changing. You can kind of see the, the waves are turning and then you find yourself in a group that appreciates you for who you are and they actually encourages others to be who they can be. And um, so I think it is finding that place and it's not always easy. And I have been fortunate enough to find the leaders who support me for what I do and the way that I show up um, and the way that I don't show up. And But I, I think, you know, now that I've been doing it for six years, you know, this is 1,504th one that I have made, you know, mm -hmm. on the way to work. I also am um, giving myself a way to express myself that is very uniquely me. And it would not have happened if I just did it once or twice or three times or even a month or a year. Um, so I think there is also strength in consistency in how you do it, why you do it. And there is also beauty in storytelling because, you know, obviously there's a story behind this, this wearable Tracy and how that storytelling connects other people to understand who I am and what I do. Um, and like, I think every day is a choice for me because I 
in the beginning when like right now it looks quite structural sometimes people say like oh yes very architectural i can see why you're an engineer i don't see it but people you know kind of try <laughs> to make patterns out of what i do um but in the beginning it wasn't it was like a bird nest on my head didn't have any shapes or forms it was just like falling everywhere but now that after several years you begin to see that within 45 minutes you can create this structure that other people can say like wow that's a piece of art um so so I think definitely there is uh, recognizing what the system is, how far I can push, and then also um, have something for people to understand what you do. Because when people don't understand, it's threatening to people. You know, mm -hmm. they they got scared. I, I, I actually, can imagine. Yeah, yeah. There was a lady. I went to the you know kitchen area in our old building, I was on the, initially I was on the third floor and I moved to the fifth floor and I was just having my coffee. And this lady looks at me and she's like, you know, there's a room on the third floor that's full of those things. And I was like, because you know, I moved from third floor to fifth floor. She only re recognized the third floor room, which I had like hundreds of these things. And I was like, oh, really? And she said, um, yeah, you know, that room is like a mushroom. It grows every day. It grows and grows. And sometimes it comes out. I got so scared of that room. I actually changed my route when I get to the third floor. I don't pass by that corridor anymore. And I was like, oh, my God, really? And she said, yeah, you should see it. And I was like, well, that room actually moved to the fifth floor, you know? And she was like. <laughs> it's following you. <laughs> really? And I said, yeah, it's my room. And she looked at me like, why would you do such a thing? You know, like <laughs> she got scared. And I oh, recognized boy. that, oh, when yeah. things does not make sense to people, for sure, people get scared. People yeah. are fearful. And so, but when you share stories behind why I do it, then it makes sense to them. So you just kind of have to give that that way for people to connect. Because I think in the beginning, I had people turn around and not wanted to make eye contact with me. It didn't make sense to them. <laughs> so I, I just want to add for people listening, because uh, obviously they don't don't, don't see you. Um, there is uh, actually, if you, you can Google your name and then uh, uh, yeah, the New Yorker has a wonderful short film uh, with you uh, uh, in it uh, about the wearable tracing and why you wear it. And and yeah. that's, uh, that's actually, I, I saw that before we actually met, but a long time, long time ago. Um, but what I thought was really interesting in what you but said. Maybe well. also, but maybe also quick context yeah. is that every um, every working day or every day? Yeah, every day when I come into work. I mean, in the beginning, the first year was every day, regardless of me coming okay. into work or not. So every day you um, wear a, a big, uh, a spec, well, every day you wear a pipe cleaner hat. Yeah. And uh, and then, yeah, and that's the that's yeah. then yeah. what we're talking yeah. about in case that in case the audience yeah. hasn't uh, followed along yeah. yet so no worry i'll yeah. put a link uh, in, uh somewhere <laughs> yeah in, it uh, looks like i have a uh like a tree growing in my head uh, you know out of my head not a big <laughs> yeah. one like uh, uh, no. maybe twice as big as a chia pet <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah now it's pink at least yeah, uh, yeah. the colors change um no it's it, it's wonderful um because what really uh, stuck with me was this. Uh, also, in the, in the film, you see, you're, you know, you're walking, uh, you know, through the city. But this idea of um, uh, being sort of this intervention, you know, uh, and that's for a lot of people. It's just because I think most people, when they hear the story, they'll get it because what you said, you know, you get these meetings with people. You meet people in a totally different way because they'll go like, "What's why? What are you doing?" You know, so you get all these connections, which otherwise you would not have uh, had. Um, but it's very courageous for a lot of people who will be like, you know, people think I'm crazy and I don't want to stand out. And I, I don't want that. So, you know, being an island girl <laughs> <laughs> still, I mean, it's a it's a it's a really fascinating transition, I think. Yeah. Uh, to not just only be in New York, where you say everybody's different. Everybody, a lot of people stand out. You go like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, I will play that game. Um, so even, you know, so it's such a, um, so in a way, we, and well, maybe one question is, and maybe we maybe already have the answer to that, but still, um, if you would have stayed on the island, 
would you have ever done that? Would you no. be wearing, right? No. So where, uh, my mother where, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, please, your mother. I, would, I want to hear. My, my mother actually uh, questioned, why would you put yourself into a situation where people can make fun of you? Yeah, no, exactly. exactly. Right? I think like, a lot of people, people have, would think. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's vulnerable. Um, and when I'm in Korea, I actually do not wear it. Like when I, when I go to, um, you know, because... The idea is for me to connect with the people. And in Korea, who am I going to, like, because I, I want to go to Korea to visit my family. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, maybe maybe in the airplane, I'll wear it. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, like you because threw there's, security? There's still, yeah. Oh, yeah. I In the airplane, uh, on the airport, beep, I wear beep, it. Beep. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, in in the beginning, it was just for me to challenge myself for 365 mm -hmm. days and, you know, mm -hmm. like, let me do it until Tracy's next birthday. Uh, and then it became a partnership between me and my daughter where, you know, she draws every day and I take a look at it and then I, I make shapes out of things or the things that the feelings that I get from her, her drawings, I do it. Um, now, especially when I go to places where... I in the beginning, like you know, the first year, um, I didn't have other than the challenge. I didn't have anything to push me. Like I just mm. wanted to do 365 days. I'm gonna do this one. This is my challenge to myself. Uh, but after a year, it became a challenge to see, like, will I be able to make connection with a stranger that I have never met or uh, or know anything about me? You know, because mm -hmm. you when you go to work, you know that they work in certain places and you have certain things. But when you get on the subway, CEO or, you know, a, a clerk or just the students, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You don't know who is who. So there is a chance encounter that could happen just based on your level of curiosity. And and that's what I was really kind of excited to test out on. And I had ran into people on the subway. Uh, and those are the ones that I really, really love because um, in the subway, there are people who are not, who you're not going to meet in your daily life. On the subway, like, you know, I have in the in the film, although you don't see it, there was this old man who looked at me and then say, that's beautiful. And then I asked his name, what's your name? And he says, Juan. And I got to learn that he has a daughter who has... Um, you know, separated from him, but he still loves his daughter. And, and he tells me all these stories. And and I just feel so yeah. privileged yeah. to be yeah, but you to puncture, be able to hold on to that story. You yeah, know? but you puncture a bubble. Yeah. That's that, because it's an intervention. People go like, huh. Yeah. And then and then, you know, something opens up because otherwise everyone acts the same and they're all in yeah. their own space, trying to kind of get keep their private space, especially in, you know, in, in busy areas. And you kind of go, Plop, you know. And sometimes, you, yeah. And sometimes that puncture takes three years. So people have seen me and I because you know, I don't mm. see people. So like yeah. I'm at a bus yeah. stop. And three years after I started this, this guy comes up to me and, and he was like, I've seen you. Yeah. Different one. Why? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. after three years, you know, I, would, I think I would question, be that. Right? I would be so, <laughs> so. So for me, I'm a bit of an, uh, I'm a little bit autistic uh, when it comes to, I'm, you know, when, when I'm out there in the wild, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm shy and I would, I yeah. think I would be at the bus stop with you and I would go like, my brain would go like, what's going on? Yeah. Like, I'm so curious, um, yeah. but I'd be afraid to ask. So yeah. maybe not three years, but if, you know, maybe the, you know, after a few weeks, you're still there and it's different. I might go like, they're very pretty. Yeah, or, or right? something, or when we make eye contact, they're like, "Okay, yeah, I gotta." Ask. Sorry, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but it takes a while because you go like, "Can I? Is yeah. that okay?" Uh, maybe you go like, "Mind your own business." Yeah. <laughs> like, so like, or you yeah. go like, "What's on my head? What do you mean?" <laughs> what, what, <laughs> I don't see it. There's you nothing on my head. <laughs> you go like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so, yeah. No, but that's the thing. You don't know, and we as humans. So I mean, it's, yeah. It's, 
it's kind of funny in a way, but it's also sad that you, because you, you don't know, you can't read people's mind. Yeah. You don't know what the inter interaction is going to be like. So you rather stick to your, you know, your own little private space. Yeah. But if we would know that if that that if I would ask you about it, we would have this wonderful conversation. But I can't. I can't. I don't know. So yeah. there's this uncertainty, yeah. right? It, and yeah. that's, but that's also that's also beautiful, right? Because if you know that that's exactly what's going to happen, yeah. then you can choose to opt in or not. Right. Okay, yeah. Okay. But if you don't know and you're brave enough to take that little step, say, "Hey, you're wearing a beautiful hat." Yeah. yeah. They're kind of also like this magic and like, okay, yeah. let's, she's doing something a little bit not I'd normal. Be, I'd be, I'm doing something a little yeah. bit not normal. I'd be the yeah. guy that I would be in this bus stop and someone else would start that conversation straight away. <laughs> someone else come and in you, and, and say, you'd be wow, thank God she's and I know, here because like, I want to hear everything. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But, I, but I'd be too embarrassed to then kind of, you know, also join the conversation. Yeah. And uh, But I'll tell you so, sort of something because it, uh, um, so there's a, uh, there's a, someone I, I know really well for a long time. Um, but when I got to know her, um, so she, one of her eyes, you know, you don't, you never know exactly which eye looks at you. So I don't know what you call mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, uh, but one eye is actually the eye she looks at you from, but you don't know it. You can't tell because mm -hmm. she looks two different ways. And, uh, and so, and I, I, I just didn't talk about that. I never asked her and I was just kind of, you know, focusing on, you know, so I, because I wanted to look her in the eye, uh, because you know that's what you do is you people when I mean, you talk to each other, you look at each other, and I in my brain was going, uh, where do I look? So <laughs> when it, which one is she looking at me? Isn't it? And then uh, and then it, I you know and it and I I met her many times, and then I thought now it's too late because <laughs> now I can't ask. Like what's we, your name again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's your name again? You're like, you can't ask. And, yeah. like, and then a friend and a friend of mine who uh, I he joined one day, and it was the first time they met. And the first thing he asked is like, "Oh, which eye is your right eye? Which one is uh, you know mm -hmm. is the one you're looking through?" And and she said, "Oh yeah, this this one." And they're like, "Damn it! Yeah. <laughs> Damn it! Why can't I?" <laughs> Why, what's wrong with me right and it's so yeah but i think a lot of people have that is this kind of you know because you don't want to insult people and so there's too much inner chatter in my head going yeah. like oh or yes or should i i don't know oh, too late <laughs> like, yeah you know what so, was interesting so ohio since you talked about ohio so my friend tracy whose birthday i have forgotten she's from middletown ohio oh, nice. and uh so she was working on this opioid crisis you know meeting with the mm -hmm. opioid addicts and so she got to know this person very privately um, mm -hmm. through her research. And she, you know, she asked a few of us in her friend circle to come to Ohio to do this um, field study with her. We're going to go to this town, part of the town that opioid addicts kind of live in. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, because I was making things every day, I had a couple of them left. And so I said, well, let me bring a few of them for them. And Tracy said, no, no, this, this is not going to work. They don't care about those things, right? But her friend, and then so the, the person gets on the car when we got there, and she looks at this crown, and she was like, oh, my God, can I have it? So, oh. you know, because she thought that because she's an addict and she's going through different life uh, challenges, this would not be something that they will react positively. But she loved it and she wore it. You know, we went to the uh, downtown area there. And for some reason, wearing this made her feel a little bit more normal, that she can walk into a store that she has never been to because she you know, she has been ostracized for so long. Yeah. Um, that being able to actually do that was pretty cool to her. And so I think, you know, sometimes mm. we think that some people will not appreciate the creativity, the craziness, the things that like through our uh, eyes of system, it might look a little bit bulging here and, you know, <laughs> kind of like, you know, not quite smooth. But sometimes those are the ways for us to really have a conversation with those people that we might never understand. So like our assumptions of, although we are very open-minded and, you know, we are um, quite exploratory in, in many different ways, I think mm -hmm. 
sometimes you let people to react to yeah. what you have will provide you with different answers than your years of studies and um, understanding of your own people. Yeah, that's a really beautiful example. Yeah, because I can also I can also imagine that I would be super curious to hear her experience of then wearing it because she probably has one experience of going into new stores or going into yeah. different parts of town. And her experience is probably very different than when she was wearing the hat. Right. It was and very positive, wasn't, right? Because they, yeah, they and maybe it wasn't, were focusing on the, the hat. hat. Then yeah. her like drug addict demeanors yeah. or gestures, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so for me, yeah, maybe it wasn't coming from a place of creativity per se, but then just the social element is really yeah, the uh, but you're touching yeah. upon something that is so such an uh, yeah it's fascinating i so i, I, I uh, my first job was photographer and um i done a, a series on uh, uh homeless people uh people mm-hmm. living in the streets and um i call the, the the invisibles uh because once you start really paying attention you also notice that people do not see them or don't want to see them mm-hmm. so yeah. they just walk past them and because they're uncomfortable uh to look at and you and you feel you, know, you can't help anyway and so they become these invisibles and and the things that they sometimes do to kind of you know, you know ask for attention um is, is 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 yeah it's so sad in a way um but so there's there's something there too so i'm just saying that these kind of interventions, they kind of uncover things that we otherwise know and don't see, right? You you kind yeah. of you 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 create an intervention. So that kind of creates a little it get the, it gets feedback from the system. And you're like, huh, you know, we don't see these things anymore. We don't notice these things anymore. Yeah. Or, or we take them for granted, or we never thought about that. So it's not so much about the wearable Tracy in that sense, but it's more about you're no, you're you're kind of creating this intervention and it's about the system how it responds which is so yeah. interesting similar and- things happened um so my friend is a palliative care pediatric palliative care doctor so she deals with children who are dying um and i was you know volunteering with her in understanding what what we as a healthcare system can help um and the first thing of course you know it was like a long time ago, seven years ago. And because I was starting out, you know, I was like, well, can I interview these kids? Um, and I wasn't thinking, I, I really did not know that they only had a few weeks to, or months to live. Like I had no idea, right? Um, and I wore this hat and, you know, my friend said, maybe it's not a place to wear. And I'm like, why not? Like, you know, and and she said, okay, wear it. And actually, the um, the social workers, the administrators, the children, um, their reaction was very positive, because, and I think it's almost like putting a museum in a children's hospital. Like whether it's it doesn't have to be an intensive care units, um, you don't expect it, right? You expect it to be sterile, clean, uh, oh, yes. adding yeah. art. Yeah into children's hospital mm. might not have been something that was always there, but somehow some some person thought about maybe art and care comes together. And they had that inter- systematic intervention to bring, maybe if people smile more, maybe people feel more comfortable in the place where they are being cared for, maybe their recovery will be faster. Like, I don't know what this, you know, the decision was, decision point was, but I saw that there are so many assumptions we make by going in to be professional in our appearances and, you know, say the right things. But maybe that might not give you the best result. But you don't know it because we don't, we're not given the chance to test out. And in a way, in a strange, again, very unexpected way, what Wearable Tracy did was to test assumptions about what is allowed and what is better for the receivers, not from the safe, you know, playing safe on, on our end. Um, exactly. So, yeah, so that's, that's that was an interesting experience that I had at the children's hospital as well. Yeah. And it's so um, interesting because based on these different contexts, 
the intervention does something different, but also like, cause your motivation behind initially creating and then continuing to wear the, the wearable Tracy was one thing. And you could have done that in different ways, right? I want to be out of my comfort zone. I want to encourage these social interactions. It didn't have to be a hat. People who then see that or interact with the hat, they also have these different experiences and encounters in different ways. And so maybe their motivation isn't the same as yours, but it's then also providing them what they need or I don't know. It's uh, And like you said, the, the challenge to test assumptions. Um, I don't know. There's just something really, uh, really yeah. interesting about that. Because what if we could all find something for ourselves that we kind of dare ourselves to kind of keep pushing that boundary and that edge for ourselves, And also how does it help us interact mm. or connect with others? Yeah. I think the world would be so, uh, so different even yeah. for yeah. ourselves, you know, if we just did that to, even for uh, six months or something. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the, the wearable trace is a metaphor and something that we can all find. All, we all create our own wearable Tracy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. What's the thing? Yeah. 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 And it could be just simply, you know, asking questions. Exactly. What if I, every day I start by sending emails to, you know, five people? What if I start, you know, whenever I see somebody saying like, you know, find something that you really like about that person and then say it, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be. Exactly. Yeah. However, I think. Like what wearable Tracy gave me was a way to not hold on to it. Mm -hmm. So although I made 1,504 wearable Tracy's, I only have about 10 of them in my house. Mm -hmm. Rest of them are somewhere in the world, uh, right? Um, because the idea is not for me floor, to... On the fifth floor. I yeah, I on the I fifth heard. floor. Now. There's, a rumor, <laughs> there's a rumor about a room. Scare, right, scare right, place. Yeah. But they're growing yeah. they're growing them there That's yeah <laughs> and you know after five i give it away to people and there were a couple of art shows that i had where people come and yeah. i ask them you know take it but promise me that you will wear it outside because when they wear it it just brings a smile I, so many people told me that like oh my god you know like you would not believe how many people complimented or smiled and so um, whatever the experiment it is, if there is a way for you to kind of mm -hmm. allow that person to experience it themselves as well, it's not, it doesn't have to be a requirement, but I thought um, mm -hmm. each time I'm, I'm trying to, you know, see how far can I push this button a little bit more. And now, you know, with, with this, we had a, a friendship parade where we invited people um, and then say like, hey, let's go around the, the block and all we'll all wear it. And then we'll call it Friendship Parade. Um, <laughs> and we had a great time there as well. Cool. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And so I'm also thinking because you've been doing this now, I think for six years, six, mm -hmm. you know, you're up to 1500 hats. Yeah. Um, so you've been doing this for some time. So is it still pushing the boundary for you? And of course, it's still adding a lot of value because you're still yeah. doing it. But is it something that's still pushing the boundary for you or have you added a new challenge or are you working on something else as well? Because when we first started, you said something about, you know, I don't always think about where I'm, where I've been, but also where I'm going. So yeah. where are where are you going? Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, so, you know, in, in terms of just like making visible, tangible, you know, uh, physical product this probably will be continuously whenever, you know, for, forever. Um, at least that's what I'm thinking, <laughs> you know. But in terms of, because I'm now thinking about experiences and um, the way that I have created experiences was more of a facilitation. And within the facilitation, I'm really interested in this storytelling because I think what really made Wearable Tracy come alive is not because it's beautiful art. It's because there is a story behind what I make and then how they can be part of the stories. So my latest project is to allow people to come to a place with their singular stories and then create collective stories and then create experiences based on these collective stories. And I call this one as um, the beauty of human stories are not created based on the, the data that feeds into the stories. Beauty of human stories that we can relate to it, right? Mm -hmm. So 
the because I have written uh, stories with the ChatGPT, and my daughter, ten years old, she also has written stories with the ChatGPT, and sometimes she gets frustrated because it gives you this exactly the same story with a little bit of variation yes. because that story does not have a soul in it, and no matter how bad my story is, a little bit of my soul is buried into that bad story, right? So my Continuous experimentation for the next part that I'm exploring this year is how can we bring individual stories that has element of you in it, um, create collective stories, and then create experiences for people who do not know your individual story, but somehow can relate to the experiences from their stories. So um, I'm I'm doing it with experimentation. You know, it's like I just, uh, you will see. Every once in a while, I'll put call out to the world. Hey, you know, I'm I'm running this experiment. Come and join us, and then um, figure out because I've seen a lot of framework on creating experiences. You know, five is experience and like different ways of creating experiences. Mm-hmm. And I want to actually be able to not follow the framework with activities. I want to be able to create a way for people to um, bring themselves in to creation of something. So I don't know what it will be, but that's my latest experiment. And uh, when it's done, I would love to share it with, you know, with Arne, you, and and see whether we could yeah. actually uh, make it a little bit more of a offering to the world. Cool. We're in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's uh that's really that's really powerful because then also you mentioned one time you met an old man and you know his name was Juan and then he started to share his story yeah and because it wasn't just you sharing your story it was also this coming together of mm. of things and and if we could yeah and, and that story time. resonated with me because although you know I have my family my, you know I have my mom and you know uh but we have a estranged relationship we have like a little bit of a, a tough relationship. Mm-hmm. And when he said that I have a difficult relationship with my daughter, I am a daughter who has difficult relationship with my mother, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's what I mean by like, we came from different world, but we can connect because mm-hmm. your experiences somehow have some experiences of mine. And I think that's the human story that we can connect with each other he's talking as a father i'm talking as a as a do- i'm receiving it as a daughter mm-hmm. and um i think you know the beauty of the human story is that we could actually look at one story but with a different eyes and you know get different experiences and and that's that's something that i think i don't know hopefully the technology will not take away uh, from us you know no i, I think, think we'll have to actually... fight uh yeah, yeah. We'll have yeah. to fight uh fight against the machine here yeah <laughs> well yeah i am a little bit more positive i think uh it will actually um elevate the, the human story it yeah. will make it more actually it will make it stand out more because yeah. Um, when we talk about empathy, for instance, I mean, when a, when a, when a machine tells you a story about having a difficult relationship with uh, its father or its yeah. mother, uh, we go like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, right? And you go, eh, it's not really, I don't care. Uh, because it's a machine. And when a, a human being says it, because we are human beings. And so listening to stories of other human beings is the human story. Mm-hmm. which is very different. It's not just a story. It's yeah. about life and going through life and having all these, you know, similar um, experiences. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think that's just, we're going to have, actually, and I think technology should be there to actually give us the time and space and the freedom to actually uh, become more human even. Yeah. Um, to even have to have that time to actually do the things that are more meaningful and then working in a nine to five job in a cubicle. Uh, all right. I think it, that's, it should free us up. And, yeah. uh, and I think that's what the technology should be about. Um, yeah. You know, I, there's so many other things and there's so many questions because <laughs> I, I wrote so many other questions that we didn't cover because one thing I, I just need to ask it because I think we didn't even, 
I didn't, I don't think we asked because you said, you know, you, 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 you came to New York or to, to Boston actually when you were 11. And I, I don't remember. No, I, I came to Seoul when I was 11, came to Boston I, when sorry, I was 18. When you were 18, sorry, <laughs> when you were 18, yeah, 11, 18. And, and when you were 18, and I can't remember asking uh, why. Yeah, you so know, I, like didn't ask me I, why. Why did you when you were 18? Why did you go? Because I was afraid of failure. So in Korea, the academic achievements are determined by each grade mm -hmm. you go. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was following that step by step. I'm gonna, you know, if I do this, I'm gonna get to this one. And in my sophomore year or maybe my junior year, I have determined that I'm not gonna get into one of the top schools. And I couldn't accept it, that I'm going to not be the one of the success. So I already determined that I'm a failure. <laughs> and instead of just leaving the failure, I said, why don't I just uh, divert? <laughs> you know, I'm going to go to another land where I'm going to be able yeah. to start new again. Um, yeah. And I was able to manipulate <laughs> my parents <laughs> to believe that I'm not actually running away. I'm paving a new way. <laughs> is this is this um, an example of Nunchi? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Underst I say, yeah, understanding what they're looking for, tell the story that they want to hear. Um, and that's how I came to the States. And so I say I am a escape. Uh, I escape from a country because of my fear of failure. Now I am. That's why I'm comfortable to say that I am very dumb because <laughs> I didn't know how to succeed in the system that was given to me. So yeah, the yeah. only way I knew was to run away. But yes. the fact that you could see the system, say this system isn't going to work for me. I, I need to find a new system. That's very smart. Yes, very smart. I know. All right, let's look no at that. I'm very smart. I'm very annoyed. <laughs> I'm very annoyed with you. Uh, <laughs> you're talking to two people who are very uncomfortable in systems as well. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're both. Uh, I think uh, being sort of um, we we you know being sort of these um, people that that don't fit in are the ones actually that are the ones that can really move us forward um, because we see sort of the the things that other people are stuck in and they don't know this because they take it for granted and you can, can puncture that bubble being with your wearable Tracy or with, you know, the way you talk about yourself and the way you present yourself and the things you do, the people you bring together, um, you know, uh, you, you know, also in your community designer kind of role. I mean, that's, that's something, those are the people we need. And those are the people that will come mm -hmm. to the service at the moment because, and nobody's teaching them, nobody's helping them. And so I think us uh, and, and you specifically, the way you present yourself and show another way of doing things and an, another option is so liberating for many of us, for many people like, oh, yeah. you know, you give us an option that nobody ever thought about and, and it's beautiful. And we're like, oh, And we're, you know, it makes you jealous a little bit. Like, I wish I could be. Wish that I had that courage. courage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we think, but yeah, but at the same time, you know, it asks, it, it it makes you ask questions about yourself as well. Go like, huh, mm -hmm. why don't I have that courage? Because I, I should have that courage. I, so it, it really, people like yeah. you help us to see an option and give us sort of that confidence saying, hey, I can actually, I can go a little bit that way. And that gives you more freedom and and opportunities to meet other people and to make new connections and and I think that is the so I think yeah so I think yeah you know, and it has nothing to do with being dumb. Um, I think I think there's a fine line between being in a panic zone and being in courage yeah, because I was sure. I wouldn't have considered myself courageous at the time. Right. I, I consider myself I'm panicking. I need to I need to find a way because this is not gonna make me who I want to be. So I gotta yeah. find another way. I wasn't thinking like, oh yeah, this is gonna be like I'm gonna push forward and, and do this. No, but, but that's not courageous. Courageous is doing things you're scared of. Courageous <laughs> is doing things you're I was so I out. wasn't courageous. <laughs> I was I would have been more courageous if I stayed because I was scared of failure. So I jumped mm. off. All right, all so right, it's right, almost right. like you know, you see the <laughs> the ship is burning, uh -huh. and yep. I couldn't stay in that ship because I was going to burn. So although yeah. I didn't know how to swim, I said I'm gonna jump off and hope 
that there yeah. will be a floater or something to to take me, and then and then and I was able to. That's how I ended up in the Netherlands. I could, oh. see, I could, yes, yes, I could see yeah. my life if I stayed, and I, and so people always say, "Oh, you moved. You're so courageous." And I didn't feel courageous because I yeah. saw what would happen if I stayed. And I said, that cannot be it. Yeah. And so I'll do anything else. Yes. Yeah. yeah but yeah, I mean, right. that, that, that means that you, you, you moved, you, you acted, you did yes. something. You could have just, you know, you know, be hi hiding in your room or something, you know, True. You know like, True. you know, shut the world out and, and not wanting to interact with that. You, you chose actually to, to kind of leap forward to kind of well, like, huh. And you know, create this amazing intervention for yourself. I mean, I think for a lot of people, you know, that is very, that is courageous, but because it doesn't feel that way, it, that makes it courageous. I mean, if you go like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be the hero here. That's not courage. You're that that's dumb. Then you're just like, <laughs> then, you're, then you're just stupid, right? <laughs> like, okay, yeah. fine. That's not courage. Um, but I, I think definitely we, both Morgan and I probably are more action driven. So we're not thinking too much about like, oh, if I stayed and I'm going to strategize, like, you know, another year, I'm going to be better at this. And then I'm going to move on to the next one. And then maybe hopefully I'll be able to find a good college to go in and find a good job, you know, and all that. And I was like, no, that's not going to work out. Let me do something else. <laughs> so so I think definitely uh, maybe I would consider myself very impatient mm -hmm. in the system that we see. It's not yeah. going to give me. So in order for me to see change, maybe more optimistic as well, that I believe that the other side is brighter. So let me go to the other side and then see what light I can see there, because I definitely don't see light here. Yeah. Yeah. And I worked with a coach on, she was like a life coach and she specializes in transitions. So hand, how do you hand, and how do you handle life transitions? What are your patterns? Yeah. And she found out that for me, I always need to get pushed into a corner. <laughs> and that's when, the, <laughs> which is really, really uncomfortable, but that's when something really interesting and usually beautiful happens as well. Yeah. And so then it's also talking about the chaos or the, the crisis that we yeah. were talking about in the beginning as well. Right. Like, okay, I planted these seeds. We didn't think it really took, but then when there was some external pressure, that's when things. Uh, yeah. 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 Definitely. There is a, when moment of crisis happens in our lives, you could just to shut down and have you know inhale the smoke that comes from the bottom or you could jump off <laughs> the window and hope that there is a firefighter down there with a little bit of cushion <laughs> to save you or a tree um to break the fall definitely take the action of don't wait for somebody else to save you just save yourself <laughs> yeah you know um yeah to frame that in a slightly different way um <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, objects that are in flux, they stay in flux. And objects that are 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 not, they're still, they stay that way. Yeah. So you need to create movement. You need to do. You don't, so you're not, if you wait for that movement to happen to you, it probably won't because, <laughs> you know, nobody's waiting for you. No one is, which, you know, is a sad truth but it's yeah. so so yeah. you need to start that movement yourself find a way to jump ship or whatever or that learning yeah. or whatever image you want to have in your head but but you created flux you created movement and and that is the key i think uh to yeah. uh, understanding uh how to deal with the system by jumping out by going like yeah, yeah i'm going to jump out because that's when you saw it because that's when yeah. you learned like oh this is where i'm from you know, and, and and so your identity can grow because of that knowledge and you can be, become you. And, uh, you know, when we started with, who are you? You know, who am I? Who, you know, in, in this world and this, and because you kind of traveled and you went to, you know, to another place and you could see where you, where you were from, from a distance. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I think that is, yeah. So also for you, Morgan, right? So it's the same mm -hmm. because you changed because you moved. Um, yeah. 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 And I think, of course, we're talking about burning buildings and jumping off of ships, but <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't have to be so dramatic either. Just no. by you changing up your subway routine right. and wearing something on your head, that was already in a way exactly. just taking that step outside of the the normal or the ordinary. Yeah. And and um, 
Exactly. Yeah. And I think it would be so, so insightful for so, you know, for all of us just, just to embrace that a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, Create an yeah. intervention, you know, however, however small. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Go, you know, make a new way to work. Yeah. Take a new way to work. Yeah. yeah try it. Out. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's how it is. And say yes. And, yeah, say yes. <laughs> that's say a good yes. one. That's a good one. To talk exactly. to a stranger, Arda. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. That's way, no. <laughs> too much. Too much. Yeah, too much. Too, too soon. <laughs> no, I, no, I actually, I am doing this more and more because I, uh, so my wife actually does that all the time. I'm so jealous. Um, and I have a friend. Uh, Peter, uh, he um, he's he's totally crazy. But I actually remember walking uh, in New York with him um, uh, on the street, and he would approach everyone. He would go up to anyone when he goes like, "Oh, that's a wonderful coat. This is amazing. Where did you buy this one?" And like, you know, and he and I and, he, and, I, and I I'm so jealous of that. Because, I love hanging out with those people. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I'm so I'm like, oh my god, I wish I had a little bit of that. Um, so okay, let's 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 um, have, find that uh, courage, everyone. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, oh, it was fun! Thank podcast. you so much for inviting and making yeah. me to reflect on who am I. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Thank same, you. Same for same. sharing. It's also yeah. It's like also making me reflect. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you back uh, with yeah. a, new, a new experience. And, yes. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.